This lecture is about consciousness or our awareness of what's going on in the environment around us. So consciousness is often referred to as the hard problem in psychology and philosophy and a lot of other disciplines because we really don't understand how it is that we have consciousness or why we have consciousness. Uh, we are able to identify some of the phenomenon of our consciousness, the way that it works, but the bigger picture of how and why is really unclear. But what we do know in terms of how it works is that there is a limit to our consciousness and to our awareness. So when you think about how much information is trying to get into your system at all times, your brain really can't handle it. We've talked about this in the context of the reticular formation, which is the part of the brain that screens out some of the, the sensory information coming in through your body. So the example of are you thinking about how it uh, feels for the seat against your butt right now, or do you notice how it feels your hair against your neck? Usually we don't because a reticular formation of screens that out. The estimate is that for every 11 million pieces of sensory information that come in, we only process 40. So what that means is that our attention really needs to be focused on part of the environment because we can't process all of it. So there is something called selective attention, and psychologists refer to this as our ability to focus on the important parts of our environment or the important parts of our experience. So for example, the reason that you don't think about how the seat feels against your butt is because it's not important most of the time. Other things are more important, like what's going on on the, the roads as you drive, or what's being said in the classroom as you're taking notes. So what that means is a lot of things get missed and a couple of the ways that that happens first is through inattentional blindness and inattentional blindness is simply where we just don't notice a lot of things as they are. So for example, maybe you've been driving down the street and you notice a Starbucks on the corner that you've never noticed before and you turn to the person in the car with you and say, hey look, it's a new Starbucks. And they kind of roll their eyes at you because they're like, uh, dude, that's been there for like two years. And you just had never noticed it before because it wasn't part of some your interests or what your body or your mind thought was important. Another example is change blindness. Change blindness is what happens when we are not paying attention to things as they change and don't even notice that they change. This is what was in play when you watched the gorilla example. You did not see the people walking in or out of the uh, exchange of the basketball and you probably didn't notice the background color changing. It's because it wasn't the things that your brain was telling you was most important so you really weren't processing that information. Sometimes you will pick up on things that are important that um, seem a little bit funny and this is what happens in the cocktail party effect. So have you ever been at a party where you're talking to a couple people and across the room somebody else says your name and you hear it somehow despite the fact that you weren't listening in on that conversation? Um, this is an interesting phenomenon because it implies that you're that your brain actually is screening, literally screening through all of the information that comes in and when your name comes through the system coming in through your ears, so the implication is that your ears actually heard your name and your ears are probably hearing all the other conversations around you, but your brain decides they're not important. But your brain, or your name, is very important, so it'll let that in. So that's why you oftentimes will hear your name in someone else's conversation. That's all I'm really going to say about awakeness. I want to start shifting towards sleeping because people are oftentimes interested in this. So I want to say something about our circadian rhythm. And our circadian rhythm is our natural 24-hour cycle. So you probably know that there are certain times of the day where you feel peppy and certain times of the day where you feel lethargic and some of us are morning people and some of us are night owls. This is all related to the circadian rhythm. So this is dictated largely by the sun uh, and there are just are different physiological changes that happen throughout the day. Your basal uh, temperature actually changes a little bit, your levels of hormones um, change a little bit throughout the day then that's why you feel uh, up at a certain point and down at another point. So on average most of us have two peaks and two valleys within that 24-hour uh, cycle. Now if you think about when you like to get up, it's probably changed across your lifespan. If you have small children, you know that they like to get up really early in the morning, obnoxiously early in the morning. Um, if you have a teenager, or if you were, or recently were or are a teenager, you know that you like to sleep in quite late and go to bed quite late. And then as you get older, you start to wake up earlier and earlier. Um, and this is all without the aid of an alarm clock if you were left to your natural devices. And the reason for that is because of parts of our brain that change throughout our lifespan. So teenagers don't sleep in late because they're lazy bums. They sleep in late because their brain actually tells tells them that that's what they should be doing. So this is a, a biological process that changes across our lifespan. 
So it's just so you know um, what our typical sleep needs are. They vary also by where we are in our life. Infants need a huge amount of sleep, approximately 16 hours per day. And the reason for that is because their brain is making a ton of connections. We're going to learn a little bit about why it is that we sleep, and it's very related to the brain. Uh, as babies turn into toddlers, um, it can drop an hour or two or four, depending on where you are. Uh, children still need quite a lot of hours, so you know, 10 to 12 hours of sleep um, for small children, closer to 10 hours for middle children. This is something that as a parent can sometimes be challenging because of busy life schedules or because your child has a hard time sleeping, but it's very important to get your kids the sleep that they need. They need more sleep than you, so they need a nap and they need to be in bed um, early in the evening. Teenagers do need about nine hours of sleep. They don't usually get it because their body tries to keep them awake and then school tries to get them up quite early. Uh, most adults need seven to eight hours. There might be a few of you out there who are thinking, oh no, I'm fine, I'm four or five hours, I can make it. Um, and to that I call bullshit. Uh, most adults actually do need somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep per night to function ideally, to function at their best. Can you get, about, get by with four or five hours a night? Yeah, but you're not being the best you you can be. Your brain is not doing its best work. Um, there are a few people, a very few people, who actually only do need four to five hours of sleep a night and that that actually makes them function at their peak. Uh, and this is a genetic issue. They recently have identified a gene that um, is related to the ability to only sleep for four or five hours and be completely fine. But most of you don't have it. So if you're trying to rationalize that it's you, it's not true. You're just trying to rationalize your lifestyle and you really should be getting more sleep. Older adults, it seems like, gets less sleep, and that's not because they need less sleep. It's actually because they aren't able to keep themselves asleep. So as our brain ages and starts to um, degrade, essentially, we have a harder time keeping ourselves asleep, which is why oftentimes um, elderly people will wake up a lot in the middle of the night or fall asleep, wake up very early in the morning. So there are numerous stages of sleep that the textbook talks about, um, stages 1, 2, 3, 4, and REM sleep. And I'm not going to talk specifically about each one um, except a little bit about REM, but I do want to point that the amount of each stage changes across the night. So the graph here on the, graph here on the left uh, shows the different stages of sleep on the left with the orange areas being REM sleep. And then across the bottom we have the hours into the night you are. So you can see that in the upper left corner we're awake and then slowly in the first hour of our sleep we go from stage one into stage two, into stage three, into stage four, and then actually back up from stage four back to stage one and at the top of stage one we get a little bit of REM sleep. And then we cycle back into stage four where we stay a little bit longer and then we come back up into REM sleep. And then we start cycling into less and less deep amounts of sleep. So by the fourth hour of the night on average we're only going into the third stage of sleep and then we come back. And we don't wake up obviously but we do we do um, cycle through heavy sleep and light sleep. And across the night it's the case that you actually do less deep sleeping which is the stage three and the stage four and you do more REM sleeping. So the graph on the right shows you how many hours you've been asleep and how much of that is stage four deep sleep or REM. And REM is when your brain is doing a lot of its work. So the main reason that we sleep for our brain is to help clear out connections that aren't important and solidify connections that are. So remember as you're learning throughout the day synaptogenesis is happening. You're making new connections. But of course not all those connections are useful in the long run. So your brain basically consolidates at night. It means your brain is very active doing a lot of work even though you're asleep. And REM dreaming or REM sleep is where we do a vast majority of this brain work. It's also where we do a vast majority of our dreaming. You do dream in other stages but oftentimes it's not as story-like or as vivid. Um, it is the case that everybody dreams, and we'll talk about dreams here in a second. So across the night you are doing more and more REM sleep and less and less stage 4 sleep. So what that means is if you're only sleeping to hour 4 or 5, like some of you are I'm sure, it means that you are missing out on a significant amount of REM sleep and that's where the brain actually does most of its regeneration. So you're missing out on helping your brain regenerate after every single day. And that's why it's important you get the entire 7 or 8 or 9 hours of sleep that your body needs and that your brain needs uh, is you want it to be doing the most functioning it possibly can. 
So sometimes people ask about naps because the reality is that they just can't sleep seven or eight hours a night, um, maybe due to personal things going on in their life, or they have kids, or they have a job, um, and ask a naps are a good way to compensate? And the answer is yes. If you're not able to sleep through the eight hours of sleep at night, uh, you should try a nap because that nap will help you catch up on a lot of what you missed. Um, it's not 100% perfect. It'd be more ideal if you could sleep the eight hours at night, but given a nap or no nap, you should definitely give it a shot and try to nap. There's different kinds of naps, so if your goal is to feel more refreshed, then a cat nap, that 15-minute nap, is probably going to be the best for you. If your goal is to help your brain do some of the processing that it missed, you actually should sleep for about 90 minutes because that's a full cycle. So let's talk a little bit about dreams. Why do we dream? Um, the first thing that I want to point to is Freud's theory about dreaming because it's actually related to what a lot of people think about dreams. And Freud, um, as we will continue to learn throughout this semester, had a lot of interesting theories that haven't really been validated by science, and this is one of them. So this is not a theory that is true. I just want to throw it out there just to help give you some context of where our ideas of dreaming come from. So Freud's wish fulfillment theory says that um, there's things that we see in our dream, right? So if I was to dream about these white dogs, those would be the manifest content. But Freud says that actually these manifest content represent something deeper down in our consciousness or our subconsciousness, um, and that that's the latent content. So if I was to dream about something like the space needle, the actual space needle would be the manifest content, but Freud would say that the latent content was what that needle represented, and of course because he was so interested in our sexuality, he probably would have said it was related to some sort of phallic symbol. A more reasonable theory, though, uh, and the one that most people operate under today, is called the activation synthesis theory. So we know that we sleep in order to clean out pathways or connections that aren't useful and to solidify connections that are. So throughout the night, basically our brain is exercising its pathways through the neurons. It's basically randomly firing all over the place in an effort to figure out what to keep and what to clear out. So this causes you to have random stimulation of images and thoughts and memories and sensor, sensory information. And what happens is that your brain, in particular your left brain, tries to make sense of all of those random pieces. So it weaves a story out of that, and that's what you perceive as your dream. So it's guided by the dreamer. So is it the case that your dream means something, like if you lose a tooth, someone's going to die? No, that's more of a Freudian approach, and that's not true. But if you are dreaming about um, something, there's usually an emotional context, and that emotional context is a good indicator to you of what's going on with you because your subconscious is putting all of that stuff together. So the last thing that I want to talk about is hypnosis. Hypnosis is something that is vastly misunderstood. What it really is, is not controlling a person's mental abilities or thinking. It's actually a state of very relaxed suggestibility. So hypnosis happens when you get into a very relaxed state and you open yourself up to suggestion. Some people are able to be hypnotized and some people aren't, and that's what I mean here by individual differences. So there are some people who don't believe in hypnosis or some people who, who aren't very suggestible, and they probably aren't likely to be able to be hypnotized. And there are people who are more suggestible or who are more open to the idea of hypnosis, and they would be more likely to be hypnotized. But again, it's not mind control by any means. It simply puts you into a very relaxed state, and oftentimes when we're calm, we're less defensive, we're less scared, so we're willing to think about things that might bother us at other times or to try behaviors that we maybe aren't normally going to do. So there's a couple contexts in which hypnosis comes up. The first is in therapies, and the other one is for fun. And I'm just going to start with the for fun. Really what's going on is that a hypnotist is creating a scenario, again, where they're taking people who are willing and suggestible and um, relaxing them to the point where they're willing to do something that they wouldn't normally do. For therapy it's a little bit different because sometimes people will talk about hypnosis therapy for memory recovery, that they're going to access a repressed memory that they couldn't access otherwise. And most psychologists don't believe in repressed memories, which we'll talk about later. But there are some things we don't like to think about because they're too painful or too stressful. And therapy can help you address those thoughts because it helps relax you and get you calm before you're able to consciously consider those thoughts. So it can sometimes be helpful for those kinds of things. Oftentimes you also will hear about it as a treatment for either um, smoking, to stop smoking, or to lose weight. The effectiveness of it in those contexts varies by what's causing the problem. So sometimes 
having weight gain is caused by anxiety. We often eat to soothe ourselves. And for that case, hypnosis might be useful because it's a relaxed state. So if you're able to uh, deal with some relaxation to combat your anxiety, a person might eat less and therefore lose weight. If you're talking about smoking cigarettes, though, cigarettes is an addiction, right? Nicotine is an addictive substance, and relaxation isn't going to get you away from your addiction. It could help in the process, but it's not going to cause you to stop smoking.